very pleased this week to have on the Embodiment podcast the awesome Daniela Veltzor, who some of you might know uh, from the Embodiment conference. Was that that was 2020, wasn't it? That was so 2020. And 2018. And 2018, of course. That was the like little t- baby one compared to the. Maybe back then. It was huge back then, but it's a baby compared to the 2021. Yeah. So uh, in case anybody hasn't heard about that amazing conference, Daniela uh, co-led and mostly organized this huge, the biggest online event that had ever been seen at that stage with all the great names in embodiment, yoga, meditation and martial arts presenting. So uh, Yeah, it's about time we have you on the podcast, I think. (laughs) (laughs) um, Yeah, that's not the only thing uh, Daniela can do. She is also a black belt Aikido um, master. Is that what I can call you, mistress? (laughs) Call myself master. Like it's the second master degree and people say you start really learning when you uh, reach black belt level. So um, not master, but yeah, I reached black belt level. So now I start learning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot better than uh, I am at Aikido anyway. That's for sure. Don't fight me because you'll win. Um, what else? You've got some amazing credentials in mindfulness, mindfulness teaching, uh, several degrees, I believe, and working on or working at the University of Maastricht. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you're also a, a coach specializing currently in working with strong women, which you are one of, <laughs> and um, uh, an embodiment coach, of course, bringing embodiment in to your work. And Daniela and I first met, I think it was also um, 2018 probably, on the Embodied Facilitator course, which was then an in-person intensive, which is now uh, mostly done online, that kind of training we offer at Embodiment Unlimited. And that's where we first met and you were also course manager there for a while. So uh Daniela is definitely part of the Embodiment Unlimited family and has been for a long time and a very, very, very skilled um, uh, trainer, facilitator and coach and organiser. So, yeah, that's uh, that's the introduction. Anything major I forgot? <laughs> Probably, <laughs> but <laughs> it's... it's- I'm, I'm always saying like it's very insufficient to describe a person. So um, usually people have different opinions and there are opinions about a person as many people as this person knows. So probably you forgot something. Probably it was not important. <laughs> well, that's the things that uh, I know about and that jumped jumped out from your your website. Yeah. And uh People can go there. We'll share the address in the notes and share it at the end to to read more about you because you've also got a very interesting uh, background and basically interesting life history. But we'll hear more about that in the interview from you. Uh Um, uh, So, yeah, to start with, um, how did you get into all of this stuff, embodiment and meditation? I, I think the bigger question is actually, how could I not get into that? Because we were born with a body. And I already as a child, I was like a huge geek. Like like I was interested in all kinds of different things kids shouldn't be interested in. Not inappropriate stuff, but in, in the sense of... I was reading like Einstein stuff when I was 10. I was reading Stephen Hawking short after. I was having stuff where I wanted to know all about dinosaurs and not just 
what was in Jurassic Park in, but but really diving into how could you from bones figure out which dinosaur it is. So I was always a geek in all kinds of different things and very broadly interested. And um, at some point, necessarily, I got into um, into Star Trek and Star Wars because obviously, especially Star Trek is a lot about science and it kind of Im yeah imprinted me to to like uh, get uh, interested in science. But what was also interesting in Star Trek is there's also a big spiritual part. Like everyone knows Mr. Spock. And I was a big fan of Mr. Spock because like the pointed ears, you know, and um, like being able to suppress emotions. And as a young girl, I was struggling a lot with emotions. So that was very, very attractive to learn. And he was meditating a lot. And um, I was thinking like, I can do that. And I wanted to uh, learn this, but there were now books about this. Like I grew up in East Germany. Um, so the wall already fell by that time, um, it was still very rural. So the books in the library were limited. There was hardly anything about like spirituality or meditation. Um, so I basically took the books from Star Trek, like the novels, and was following the description of how Mr. Spock would meditate. And he would focus on one thing like the candle flame or something like this. And just sitting in a very like specific way and focusing on this candle flame. And since I didn't have a candle flame, like my parents were not too happy to like give me a candle or fire. I was using, um, when I closed my eyes, I could see like one dark spot in front of my inner eye. And I was focusing myself on that and discovered this by accident. So I was spending quite a lot of time trying this figuring out what meditation is and uh, at some point I noticed that I could like distinguish between um, physical sensations and my reaction to it in a more intuitive way so I started to play with when I would feel an itch could I not scratch which is very basic self-regulation I just didn't know that it is I was I had like this phase of interest and this faded away again. And I was still like um, interested in uh, spirituality. And there came a Star Wars phase and the Jedi's and uh, all this like mind forces and ideas. I'm um, playing with that. Um, obviously living a lot in my fantasy world in this. But this really got me into embodiment and meditation. And later informed also how I integrate this more into uh, yeah my scientific approaches into my life. And that came much later. And that was my really early experiences with embodiment and specifically with uh, meditation, which probably was not very embodied by that time. Oh, that's that's so fun. Because, uh, you know, most people say, well, I was terribly ill. I had an awful trauma, so I got into it, something like that. Um, no. Yeah. No, I was, I was just a geek. I mean, yeah. the traumas came later. No worry. Like, I, I have the stories too. But I was, as a kid, really just a geek. And I was curious about the stuff I was reading. And I was never satisfied with only reading things I wanted to try this out I wanted to be able to suppress my emotions like Mr. Spock I wanted to be a Jedi I wanted to be a paleontologist or an astronomist and in order to be <laughs> that I needed to get into the matter deep so I didn't spend much time like on school stuff I was like doing all kind of other stuff and meditation at some point was part of this because it was connected mainly to Star Trek and to my little uh, fangirl heart to Mr. Spock by that time. Yeah, oh, that's that's really awesome. And how, how old were you then, roughly? I think I was like 12, so beginning puberty. There was probably some romantic feelings involved in yeah. Spock by oh, that time. Nice. But, um, yeah, it what I was doing back then was some kind of meditation. And that was really something which was um, when I started to practice meditation more formally, which was 
I think 15 years later, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Still, it's it's great to uh, start so early. And two of those techniques, the candle flame and the black dot, are also yoga practices and, and Buddhist meditation, concentration practices. So, exactly. Yeah, you started early. And, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, it's and, a long uh, break in between, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was a bit similar. Um, I probably mentioned on the podcast before. I, I had a go when I was a teenager, just a kind of curious curiosity thing as well. But uh, I gave up very quickly because I didn't have Dr. Spock or anyone else's instructions. <laughs> so I thought I should just be able to sit and um, um, not have any thoughts, which, um, of course doesn't tend to work uh, that yeah. simply. <laughs> it, was, it was literally just like, I, I don't even know which, like like there is all these like Star Trek novels and I was reading them all. <laughs> By that time I was reading like a book a day or something like that. I had times where I was like reading a book a day, like these smaller ones. And one of them had like instructions on how to meditate, not about the outcome, not at all. That was something I made up in my mind. And my idea was I can like control. That was a big deal. Control my emotions. Like not being a victim to my... Um, it was beginning puberty. So I was all over the place emotionally. Mm. And all I wanted is to have like some kind of peace. And mm. that was intuitively um, a pretty, pretty good approach. Because concentration-based meditation is... What gives us peace of mind? It doesn't mm -hmm. give a lot of insight. That's more insight-based meditation, but it calms down the mind. And somehow it worked, at least for this time. And when I didn't need it anymore, I didn't do it anymore. Yeah, fair enough. And of course, if anybody has uh, hasn't watched Star Trek, Spock was known for not being emotional. I even remember one episode where he was artificially given em emotions and he was very, very puzzled by it. Like, wow, yeah, he's an emotion? Wow. <laughs> and he was, he was this character, like half Vulcan, half human. Um, so he was like an outcast in both worlds. Not entirely Vulcan, not like respected there because of his human side. And the human side was symbolized by the emotions. And on the other side, he was an outcast with the humans because he was too Vulcan. He was suppressing emotions too much. So he was constantly trying to surf this wave and balancing out and kind of bridging these two worlds, which made him so interesting. Not just because being a bit of a fangirl, but also because it's um, it gives a lot of insight about who we are, what, what makes us human, actually. What does it mean to be human? And um, I think that was a question which also kind of rotated for many people who liked Mr. Spock, especially. It was one of the most favorite characters of the show back then. Yeah, yeah, definitely a, a great character. And, and we keep saying, because uh, Daniela lives in the Netherlands, in Maastricht, and obviously I'm from the Netherlands, well, maybe not obvious, but... Uh, um, a lot of you will know that. And we keep saying we ought to meet up in the Netherlands. We've met up in uh, other countries, well, mainly England, probably. Um, but I would love to introduce you to my best friend in the Netherlands, Netherlands, who's a huge Star Trek fan, completely unrelated to the podcast, but we will make it happen one day. We'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so... What happened after this? I know you've had a sort of very interesting uh, career as well, where I think uh, a lot of this stuff came in. You mentioned some trauma stuff came after. So, uh, yeah, what happened after all that time of, of uh, well, your young teens? Yeah, when I grew up, um, when I became 16, my mother got diagnosed with lung cancer and she died three years later just a month before I finished my school, before I graduated uh, by school. And I think that it formed a lot my attention and also my life choices because I needed to grow up much, much earlier. 
uh, than most people around me. I kind of stopped being a teenager at this point and needed to be adult. I needed to like be home, cook, uh, prepare, kind of regulate myself because there was just no space anymore for me to be a kid um because of all the like like the roller coaster of her health like the doctors gave her half a year and um she lived for almost two and a half years which is kind of a miracle in itself so um a month before my um graduation she died and that was very very suddenly like she was on the up up hill and uh, like from christmas on it went like straight downhill and nothing worked anymore and um, I wanted to study, but I decided by then I want to study, but I do need to earn money right away. Like the insecurity of um, studying without having like a safety net was just too big. And that was certainly tra a trauma choice. So, so this whole situation was for me very traumatic and uh, brought me basically to choose for the police instead of studying at an open university or regular university. And um, it took me about 10 years to work through this um, loss. Like for, for about 10 years, I couldn't talk about this without like breaking out in tears. And I didn't know it was trauma. For me, it was like, okay, I, I got some, some difficult cards handled and I need to be strong in order to deal with this. And the only way to be strong was for me to suppress emotions because that was what I actually practiced from back then starting meditation and it took about 10 years to integrate so I went to the police I worked for the police for about 10 years definitely a space I don't want to miss I learned a lot but at after 10 years it was like enough and I felt I need to move on I wouldn't be happy there and I quit and um <laughs> the the funny thing is really I quit because I found an alternative. And that was basically starting with Aikido. And with Aikido also coming back to meditation, because um, from my perspective, it was very closely related. And I had the luck to come into a dojo, my first dojo, uh, which doesn't exist anymore. It was the Aiki Academy in Mainz, who also had a couple of members who were interested, not just in the Aikido part, so in the physical um martial art part but into the spiritual background of the art and also meditating so they introduced me into meditation and um i got my first book it was like more a breath uh breath work actually also concentration based meditation but with certain breath patterns today i wouldn't call it more breath work than meditation but it brought me back into uh, on the cushion and brought me back into this quest, which I started like much, much earlier and which got interrupted. Um, and then I met Miles, who I would consider my first real like embodiment and uh, meditation mentor. And then I started to structurally learn mindfulness-based meditation. And um, because I really wanted to study with him, and uh, the police didn't let me, like I wanted to take a sabbatical. That was basically giving like the last notch for me to leave the police and say, okay, I know what I want. For once in my life, I really know what I want. And I'm not getting, let anything get in the way. So I quit and I went to Israel uh, to study with Miles. And I sticked around for about like two or three years with interruptions, studying a lot of Aikido. That was also when I got my first degree black belt, studying a lot of meditation. I had times where I was sitting like up to three, four hours each day and getting like weekly coaching with Miles. Um, and I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I at some point I also went to Nepal twice for uh, a month in the monastery. Like I, I got really into it. I was very, very committed to finish the path of insight and become enlightened and um, all this stuff. And at some point also this integrated again. So um, kind of balancing out. <laughs> Yeah, and that was um, Miles Kessler, if anyone's wondering, who's um, a guest tutor on a lot of our 
courses, online events, and um, he's also been on the podcast, so you can look him up. K-E-S-S-L-E-R. Yeah. Yeah. I love him dearly. Amazing teacher, very clearly structured. And if it wouldn't have been for the clear structure, like grounding me a little bit, um, I probably wouldn't have stick with it. Mm. Yeah, it's very helpful, isn't it? It's kind of uh, well, often so much comes down to 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 being with the right teacher or having the right teacher, someone who really um, stimulates your interest in the right way. Um, and of course, currently, Daniela, your um, co lead, you're going to be co lead trainer on our embodied meditation course. Last year, you were already on the team as a learning assistant with um, Miles and Martin Aylward and uh, Mark Walsh and myself. And mm -hmm. so, embodied meditation is a, a big thing uh, in Embodiment Unlimited, but also you know, in, in your life, which I knew a bit about, but I didn't quite know, you know how much you've done. And since then, um, You've also qualified to lead eight-week mindfulness courses. Uh, I think you've studied or are still studying with David Trelieven, trauma-sensitive mindfulness. So can you say a bit about what you're doing uh, with, with that kind of stuff now yeah. uh, outside of Embodiment Unlimited? <laughs> Yeah, after, after coming back from Tel Aviv, I landed here in the Netherlands. That was 2015. And I landed in um, at C True Mindfulness, which is a mindfulness company here in Maastricht, who uh, basically teaches uh, therapists, psychologists, human resources uh, people using mindfulness. And they're basically doing teacher trainings on mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is a very secular approach compared to the uh, more traditional uh, Theravada Vipassana tradition I was practicing in. And for me, that was quite a hard landing because I'm a little bit neurotic. So and there, there was a lot of like, no, that's not right. Like, you need to do it like that. <laughs> and this, so so it, it, there was, again, like this integration phase where I needed to learn to open up to different approaches and that not everything which I learned needs to be in place, needs to be in place, actually. And in a way, it became broader and more narrow. Like broader in the sense like that meditation doesn't need to be formal. It can be much, much wider. Um, and a part of me, I think, regarded until then that if you're not sitting on a cushion or you're doing like a formal walking meditation, it's not meditation. Um, and I needed to learn the hard way that that's not true. Um which is probably like my first steps into being a more, bit more trauma sensitive and um, approaching or making meditation available also for people who are um, less rigid than I am and a little bit less pushy to themselves. Um, so, yeah, so, so <laughs> it was an interesting time. But I got into this and I figured or I managed to open up and getting to other resources uh, with people who are working with uh, mindfulness in a therapeutic context, especially around like depression, recovery, anxiety. Uh, there were a lot of therapists I got to talk with, a lot of like also doctors who used it and pain uh, management and this kind of stuff. And at some point, when I managed also to learn Dutch, I could join the training. And I did the training twice, which is always interesting, doing like the same training twice when you have a different cohort and a different understanding. And I also did a couple of um, additional trainings, like how to work with groups, group processes, um, teaching meditation in the workplace or mindfulness. So making it even a little bit less woo-woo and a little bit um, like like narrowing down these like two and a half hour sessions which you have in MBCT to one hour or less and still covering the content and still giving time for actual mindfulness practice but also doing it in schools so I learned to work with very very different target groups and um, 
like like starting to get behind the principles of mindfulness and meditation and starting to be able to apply this to different contexts, to different people, looking more into what is actually needed. And um, I think that really opened up for me, like like the, the whole field. Yeah, and lately I'm getting more into like formally uh, getting more into trauma-sensitive mindfulness with David Trelevin. I'm still in the training. I'm kind of watching a session every now and then just because I don't have any pressure to like finish the the, uh, the the certification, but simply out of interest. How can I make this even more um, applicable for people who struggle with meditation? Because I like like one of my favorite topics is um, talking about the myth of meditation. Because I was falling into these pitfalls all the time in the beginning. It was quite painful. So I don't think everyone needs to go through the same process. And probably most people don't go because they're less neurotic than I am. But it helps. <laughs> well, I think most people want to get it right or want to get some results. So it's it's super useful to have somebody sort of say to you, actually, you know, it's best to, to let go of these expectations. And uh, um, we, we talk a lot about the role of relaxation in embodied meditation because concentration practices are often, uh, they are a bit, you know, hardcore. Like you, you, you're practicing just focusing on one thing visually like you were doing or... Uh, just on a tiny area where you can feel the breath at the tip of your nose or something like that. And it can actually, depending on on your personality, as you say, it could induce like being too hard on yourself or even a sense of anxiety or wiredness. Yeah. uh, Isn't always helpful. Right. uh, I think... um, think Yeah, like... Starting with meditation, coming from Mr. Spock and having like a certain way to sit and a certain way to do it, kind of it it fed my um, my need for structure, but it also made me rigid. And um, for me, there came like the idea that it's just meditation. If you sit in a certain way, if you move in a certain way, if you really put a lot of effort, and that's just not true. It's just not true. Um, you don't need to sit for hours in awkward ways and totally ruin your knees and sit with pain. Um, it's just not necessary. It has, like, like, don't get me wrong, there is a benefit in doing this to some extent. But if you can't get up after an hour of meditation because your knees are so hurting or you actually damage the parts of your body, like knees, back, neck like like where pain can come up where's the benefit in this and this is what where meditation in very traditional ways can become very disembodied because Mm -hmm. i do ignore signals from the body and pain is nothing else than a signal that something is not right Mm -hmm. on the other hand sitting with like a certain amount of pain especially if i know that this pain is maybe a sign but is not really damaging, um, can actually increase focus. But overdoing it can actually also lead to that, um, yeah, that that there is like, a, that you sustain damage from, from this practice. And I think finding a balance here, this is really the difficulty. And I'm probably more the person who keeps, who likes to push, who prove like this warrior spirit and um, is always perceiving myself as the strong woman. And it took me a long time to accept that like being weak and being vulnerable, admitting when it's too much is actually a strength too. Mm. Yeah, so. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so where I think like um finding a good balance and having that's where it's so important to have a teacher, a teacher who sees where your habits are and where um where the balance is needed. If you have someone who keeps on pushing, you need to teach her sometimes say like, you know, 
you can also do a little bit less. Or if you're something, someone who never pushes, like maybe you can stay with this like unpleasant feeling just for a second longer. Yeah. But you you do need someone or sometimes like the outside perspective from someone to help you to um to, to find the right balance. It's really hard to do by yourself. And it's yeah, possibly it can be damaging. Mm, yeah. So Sounded like you you needed a, a teacher to help you with that. And, and any listeners, well, if if it's worth considering, am I someone who tends to push myself really hard, maybe too hard, uh, or not? And it, it can be contextual, of course. That like you might push yourself really hard in your job, but um, not at other times. But there's often a bit of a personality like the more driven type yeah. or less driven um, and it's yeah it might be useful to consider that in relation to meditation as well as other things in your life if you're listening and thinking there might be something in this <laughs> any any tips like are there any signs that you could look out for during meditation in your experience that might point that you're either too driven or or not enough? Well, I probably can better speak from being too driven because that's like my default. And what I noticed, and I got this reflection actually also from my traditional teacher in Nepal, like um, how he explained it is that mindfulness has like this two wings. It has concentration on the one hand And it has effort, energetic effort on the other. And that needs to be balanced. And in the first place, um, it seems to be the same thing, but it's not. So concentration, we all know what's concentration. is. That's like one single point of focus. Like when I was like watching this little black spot in front of my inner eye. Um, Energetic effort is basically sustaining with, experiences like like just staying with and um this needs to be balanced so i can either stay with an experience without having much of concentration then i will not get deep or i can try to get deep but then it becomes really difficult to actually stay with the experience so it needs to be balanced And I was always the one who was like going more into concentration. And I could feel this. I could feel this in my body, not just in the sense of being like becoming very tense and very rigid, but even like having this uh, sense of, um, they're all kind of funny, awkward, interesting experience you can have on a retreat when you're staying with a practice for a very long time. And I have the feeling of having pressure on my face, pressing here and pressing there and pressing me down and pressing everywhere. And it was really unpleasant. Like sometimes it was like pressing here and at the nerve points. And I had like migraine after meditation because I was so much on on the concentration side. And um, I needed to let go. I actually needed to open my eyes, shaking it out, coming back into my body, like broadening my my, my view. Um, the other hand, as I said, is you can stay with too much uh, of energetic effort and not having enough concentration. Then you're staying with the experience without like really starting to see what's happening in this experience. For example, let's stay with something we all experience at some point, which is pain. I can stay with the pain without getting to know the pain. If I'm staying far enough outside, I don't really get to know the pain. Like I don't understand, if, is the pain like light? Is it like more deep? Is it like uh, throbbing or is it sharp? Like you can get all these qualities. And these qualities is just if you start to focus on the pain, but not too much. You don't want to get too deep and getting lost in it. So in in that sense, you want to have like, um, yeah, a little bit of of a balance. And I think 
too much concentration. As I said, for me, it was like really, really unpleasant. And it took me a long time to get out of this again. And I do notice it still sometimes. Um, too much energetic effort, I think, is that the practice doesn't develop much, doesn't deepen too much then anymore. So you start to maybe uh, notice that you're somehow getting stuck, that um, it doesn't really change, it doesn't really move, it becomes like meaningless. Um, so that could be a sign. But I know the other part, the concentration part, much, much better. And it's definitely, it's physically a rigidity. Um, and there's like pressure, really feeling physical pressure in the sitting, which yeah. was very unpleasant. Yeah, signs of trying too hard, getting tired, getting headaches, tension in the body. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's a good, that's a really good explanation. I hadn't kind of heard it explained like that before. That's really good. And I, and I guess if if anybody is the other way, um, you wouldn't even get round to meditating at all, or you'd be uh, I don't know distracting yourself by going on Facebook during meditation or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like like it's also the 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 balance between like formal and informal meditation. Like if you notice that as soon as something unpleasant comes up, you're kind of like, oh, that's enough. I did my two minutes of meditation, then maybe you're a little bit more on this side. Like yeah. they, they, it's hard to stay with an experience without like at some point starting to let, like mindfulness in, in traditions, they say mindfulness has the, um, has the characteristic that it sings. If you stay with an experience, for example, you can do this now, staying with your breath you will start to notice more details of the breath without putting a lot of concentration on that. Just with your attention, letting it rest. You can, but you can also try to like really pierce through and like starting to label. This is like, you, you notice my voice is changing already, just <laughs> that. But oh yeah, and this is the beginning, and this is like where where it's expanding in my body, and this is the middle, and this is the end of the breath, and this is where it changes from in and out breath, and like getting really into this. But um, then then you're again on this like concentration side, and um, yeah, coming back, it needs a balance. It needs both. It's like the wingmans of mindfulness. Otherwise, mindfulness can't sink. Yeah, great. I like that very much, that explanation. I'm so glad we've got you on the course. <laughs> it's brilliant. I, I'm, it's, um, happy. I'm, yeah. I'm really honoured to do that. And we have different backgrounds as well in meditation. I've, I've uh, done more uh, Tibetan stuff um, and with quite different uh, personalities. So... Uh, yeah, I work quite hard on, on my meditation. I'm less likely to over-concentrate, I think. <laughs> so we always have a, a bit of a theme of people that have different personalities, different practice backgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, uh, different things we've learned so that we can support students uh, in lots of different ways because ultimately – Particularly uh, meditation, I think people often do need that personal, personalized support or approach or a range of options to, to be sensitive to potential trauma background, neurodiversity, uh, and also how life is at the moment. And um, you and I were chatting the other other day and I think it's fair to say we've both had a bit of a shit uh, time recently we don't have to go into details uh, if you want to but uh, I've, I've had I've had some physical pain like a fairly long for me long term not being very well and like we're like bloody hell the Buddha was right wasn't he that life is suffering it's so annoying when when things are great you know meditation is a lot easier than uh, when things are not great and often people take up the practice because they're stressed or unwell and they've heard it's a good thing to do 
it's actually quite helpful to start before the shit hits the fan. <laughs> it's not impossible, but um, yeah, how how are you with meditating when things are a bit tough? Actually, I think um, if you if if you have like some kind of practice beforehand, this is the best thing you can do. Um, a little example, like like some people know. Now more people will know. I served in Afghanistan for the German police project team. And that was just after I started Aikido and meditation, just after I basically met Miles. And um, that was also a time where I was meditating pretty much, like being in a compound where you could like, you couldn't go out of the compound. You could just walk within the compound uh, on the inner wall that would take you like 10 minutes and that's it. Um, what you would get on food options, very limited, very crowded gym where you could like, like work out and a lot of pollution. It was in Kabul. Kabul is very dirty. And then not having a room for yourself. Like I was the first three months, I was in a room where a lot of people who are shuttling through Kabul would stay. So it could be that I had one for one night or for two nights or for three nights, then a night, no one. And then the next person. So that was a very, very stressful environment. Plus working in a war area <laughs> and driving through half the city in an armored car and with weapons. And um, so I was meditating a lot and I really made it to the, that time a rigorous practice to sit in the morning for 15 to 20 minutes. I would get up earlier, um, sitting in the afternoon for a longer sit, usually 30 to 40 minutes, and then sitting in the evening once again for 15 to 20 minutes before going to bed. And I had also like this uh, weekly or bi-weekly coaching calls with Miles, like looking into my practice, really getting guidance and looking where my practice went. And one morning I um, we got attacked. I was getting up in order to sit, to meditate, and then there was a car bomb exploding just in front of the gate. And you could feel the vibration. Everyone knew it like that was a car bomb. Most people were still asleep. I had my room to the other side. On the front side, the windows were like pushed open by the shockwave. And um, I jumped up, still <laughs> being in my pajamas, opening the door. Everyone was like outside, like, what was that? What was that? And I was like, well, I would suggest... Whatever it was, we're getting dressed and getting the weapons because that was not normal. So I could stay actually, because I was basically just coming from the meditation cushion, I could stay uh, pretty calm and pretty regulated. I didn't get like into panic. I knew what to do. I had a cool hat. And it was still a highly stressful situation. But because of my practice, and because of um, having like this rigorous practice, which helped me in this very adverse environment, I could deal with a situation which was even worse in a very cool way. And I'm still a little bit proud of that because I know people who had really, really uh, uh, traumatic um, uh, problems after this, uh, like PTSD and this kind of stuff. And I didn't have this. And honestly, I'm surprised until today that I didn't have this. Mm -hmm. So um, I think if you have a practice which you can establish before shit hits, hits the fan, as Karen just said, this can be a huge benefit on a difficult uh, time. Mm -hmm. But I also want to add that you don't need to sit for three hours when the time is difficult. There's this funny Zen saying like, oh yeah, when you're busy, now when meditate each day 20 minutes, except you're busy, then meditate for an hour. No, don't do that. Because when you're busy, it's really, really hard. You put even more pressure on yourself. Meditate for one minute, meditate for five minutes. Do it in between, do it informally. Because you do have the tools when stuff gets really difficult, but you need to build up the practice before. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think so too. And again, maybe looking at you know what what type of personality are you? you know, if you let yourself off the hook a, a little bit 
too quickly, do remember that you know, the meditation is so supportive. And that's that's like an illustration of a research program I remembered reading about. Uh, I think it was Mathieu uh, Ricard, the um, French-born Tibetan Buddhist monk, and uh, they they were trying to trying to make him startle, get the startle response whilst he was in meditation with loud noises and stuff. And he 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 literally didn't blink. You know, they couldn't kind of um, get his uh, startle response going with the, with the message they were trying in any case. That would most make most of us kind of jump. And, yeah. And, Whoa, what was, what was that? And uh, you had actual experience of that in a war zone. I, I jumped, like believe me, I was I was startled, <laughs> but um, it was it was like this moment of knowing what was happening and knowing what was happening. Like like I could observe my startling response while it was happening. Oh, yeah, I didn't get lost in it, so I could actually act without being in a fight, flight, freeze response. Yeah. And everyone else was like there was literally the person who um, who had like the preparation course for Afghanistan, who was like the lead trainer of the preparation course. And he arrived the day before. And I could see that he was like really insecure. He asked me, what should we do? I was like, well, let's take a breath, maybe. Yeah. Well, that's... Really easy things which in a stress response, and it doesn't need to be a car bomb, it can be an argument with your partner, it can be a difficult situation at work, it can be like just someone on the street who's looking at you weird, um, which can bring up this up. And um, yeah, like, like if we're getting into this fight, flight, freeze response, we can't make like these easy decisions anymore because literally our like ability to think sinks like we're getting more stupid and this then brings up like reactive responses um automatic responses which kind of can escalate a situation mm-hmm. and if if you can see this reaction without like getting lost into it in it then you can actually act from a like like yeah more IQ. You can involve your prefrontal cortex into the decision, which is usually a good idea. Yes, yes, it certainly is. And uh, uh, you're going to be teaching this kind of neuroscience stuff on the meditation course, and you also teach it on our coaching and body yes. coaching certification course. Because yeah. you're currently also doing loads of stuff at the university and you, you've even learned how to operate an MRI scanner, haven't you? So yes. um, you're you're quite deeply into some research elements there as well. Could you say a bit more about that? Like you've got so much. <laughs> so much experience. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I'm making an internship there. So I was involved into an experiment last year, uh, which was looking into uh, mental fatigue and how much time it takes to recover from that and how this affects the working memory. And um, what I find really interesting in this part is that there are like, um, like, like there's a functional connectivity between different parts of the brain. So the brain operates kind of synchronized when certain functions run, like when we have when we are in rest, certain parts of the brain uh, synchronize. And when we are stressed, this kind of synchronization breaks. And this is when we feel a little bit frazzled. So we don't really do any meditation research at this point, but there is a study planned next year or this year on um, uh, meditation, which is, um, I need to look into this, what actually is planned, but a colleague of me is planning a meditation study with the MRI. So um, very curious about that. Yeah. yeah. There's so much research on meditation and mindfulness. And um, I, I will, I will look into like the whole field and will try to extract what is really interesting for uh, the meditation teachers, which will be on the course. So there's like, I'm, I'm teaching different things in neuroscience because the field is just so huge. 
And for uh, the uh, embodiment coaching session, I will teach about the neuroscience of learning and changing habits. Um, but in the mindfulness or meditation course, I will probably talk a little bit more about how meditation and mindfulness affects the brain and um, how you can see this and what actually what we can see in the MRI in that. Yeah, because it's such a fast developing field. I did a master's on this topic with some other bits thrown in, um, but that was 2014, I think. Gosh, that's a long time ago already. And things are moving on so fast, particularly in that in that field with the technology and an increasing interest in uh, things like meditation. Yeah, there, there were like times where there was, I think, 2,000 studies published each year. Um, I think specifically the early 2010s and um, this kind of like from 2000 to 2010 or 12 was like it was going up. But there are two things to be considered. Uh, the first thing is it was the topic was hip. So there was money in this. And the second thing is um, there is a publication pressure for scientists. So um, going into a topic which you can fairly easy examine and then writing an article which most likely gets published, of course, brought a lot of publications up. But the quality of these publications, this is something where people need to look very, very careful because often it's not the greatest quality. It's limited to a very small target group or it's limited to very small approach or it's not controlled for other variables which can probably influence um, the, the measured outcomes. So there is there is a lot of stuff uh, to consider looking into these studies and there are actually not too many methodologic, methodological, uh, really clean and good studies uh, which have been conducted. Yeah, yeah, that's what I found as well. But hopefully that uh, goes a bit more large scale at some point, if not already, so we get more evidence. And uh, yeah, lastly, um, as we're sort of approaching the, the hour, uh, your sort of fairly recently launched new website um, uh, for strong women, coaching strong women. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear a bit more about that. I did have a look at your website and I, I know a bit about what you're doing, but uh, yeah, how's, how's that going? And, uh, um, yeah, it's going well. So, so I'm looking mainly into um, perfectionism there and um, the need for control because this is very closely related to um, like strong women. And I honestly, I don't really like the term strong women because or, or like power women because that kind of singles out certain people. And what is with all the rest is that like this is the power woman and this is the standard woman. No. So um, I don't think that being a strong woman is actually a good thing. I don't think that we need strong women. We need authentic women. We need um, women who can express themselves, who can be direct and honest, who have a range in, uh, in embodiment, uh, from being very fierce to being very receptive. Um, and a lot of my work turns around this uh, idea that um, we don't need this notion of strength anymore. We need to bring up the value of weakness. Like the idea of, yeah, when I'm vulnerable, this is also strength. No, it's, it's a weakness, but weakness is not necessarily bad. It's not a bad thing to be weak. Like, like, separating out this evaluation of strong is the same as good and weak is the same as bad puts us under a lot of pressure. And this is one of the main sources of uh, perfectionism, trying to do everything, every time good and well, and um, in order to be deserved to be loved or to be good enough or playing a role in society and this is like a clear way to uh, burn out anxiety, depression, and all the difficult stuff which comes with that. 
So I'm kind of going more into like, let's be imperfect and be okay with that. Let's throw out the idea of being strong at the whole time. We do need the times where we can crawl under the blanket and eat sweets and drink wine and uh, just like roll a little bit in self-pity. That's okay. That's also part of human expression. And um, we need to be able to cry in public again, not just women, men also. Like make the whole range of human emotion, um, yeah, um, yeah, okay in society again. Mm. Um, so, so a lot of my work turns around actually to um, break through the notion of strong women. It's there. There's so much, um, like like a lot of my path, like growing up with. Um, um, with like all the ideas of like um, being a Jedi or being in Star Trek or being a hero and then having my mother, watching my mother dying and then going to the police and need to stand my ground in front of all the men and being in the leadership position and getting like constantly sad, like you don't have a thick enough skin. And I think that's actually harmful because it doesn't allow authenticity anymore. Mm. But, um, I think we're losing a lot of like um, uh, capital in humankind if we don't allow these like weak parts to express themselves and being okay with it being expressed, expressed, expressed from others. So um, that's why I started uh, this work. That's why I started to work with strong women to help them being more okay with You don't need to be perfect all the time. You don't need to control everything. It can be a control enthusiast. Notice that. But sometimes it's okay if things go sideways. It's really fine. Um, and Inevitable, uh, right? The Buddha said that as well. So, <laughs> and, um, I, I think there's like embodiment really coming in because um, being aware of the whole range and then being able to choose. That's that's really what it is about. And probably to those who know embodiment, I don't tell anything new. Um, it's more like I'm working specifically with women who had like um, a similar mindset as I did. Mm. And I managed to break out of it. And I'm still I'm, I'm still a strong woman, even if I'm crying half of the time in front of my friends. Like, like we talked about difficult times. Like I literally cried every day since the new year started. And that's okay, too. Absolutely. So yeah. There's no need to play a role that I have everything under control and everything works perfect. If you look at my desk or... In the background, I just got my shopping in. It's like still stapling up. <laughs> It's a bit of a mess. Well, that's life. Yeah, absolutely. And otherwise, we're just suppressing a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, that's something that meditators can get very good at. At um, thinking, sort of even thinking. I, I've done this. This is something I was training myself into uh, to think. I was calm. I was under the impression I was calm, but I was actually suppressing a whole bunch of stuff. And then every now and again, I would have an, an explosion of my own. <laughs> and since I'm allowing more emotion, I'm able to be, to be a bit more aware of how I process things, this tendency to suppression. Um, Uh, I don't have the explosions, but I'm a bit more likely to to not be calm all the time, and that's okay. So there's, yeah. there's a lot of this stuff that we look into in embodied meditation teacher training, like how can we kind of help students through this kind of thing, recognize them in ourselves, these patterns, and become more fully rounded human, basically. The beautiful, um, yeah. There are two parts to that. It's allowing it in ourselves, but also allowing it in others. Like mm. a big part of this is, and as that's especially important for teachers. Like I had people crying in my meditation classes, um, 
and being able to hold that and being empathetic with that without like falling into this like like it doesn't help as a teacher if you cry with your student because things are bad but holding the space and being just to cite Jamie Cato which I really love being a walking permission slip for that that's also part of the training like crying ourselves but even more important being okay with others expressing strong emotions might it be anger might it be sadness might it be frustration and still being able to hold this space that's a big big part of the training okay, yeah absolutely absolutely and uh, yeah come to our event in uh, february this year uh, if you're curious, that will be the 26th till the 28th. If the podcast uh, comes out before then, you can have a look. Um, otherwise, February. the training starts February. in March. Yeah. Um, 28th February, and then we start in March, because now it's still January when we record it. It, it is, indeed. Um, yeah, and so we're nearly wrapping up, but... Uh, I would like to ask you if you have a little top tip um, for uh, our listeners about embodiment or meditation or anything related. Something they I, can I, think, take away. I think different things work for different people in different moments. But there's one practice which I love to teach and which I love to practice myself, which is coming from regulation of anxiety which is a five senses uh, meditation kind of. So if you want to do it, quickly guiding it through is walk around or, or look around in your room and find five things which are green. Might be a plant, might be a book, might be a drinking bottle or a cushion. Five things that are green. And then find four different structures to touch. It can be your desk. That can be your clothes or your hair. That can be a cup. Notice how it feels to touch this. Is it soft or is it hard? Is it a nice polished surface or is it structured for things to touch and then three things you can hear it might be very far away maybe outside a car or a dog barking it might be in your room like for example the water and the radiator which i'm hearing now what might be even inside yourself, the grumbling of your stomach, the sound of your breath. Three things that you can hear. And then take two things you can smell. How does it smell around you? And then maybe smell yourself. No shame in that. How do you smell? Smell your hair. Maybe you have something around you, like a cup of coffee where you can smell. How does it smell? Two things. Then last but not least, one thing you can taste. How's the taste of your own mouth? Or if you just ate something, can you still feel the aftertaste? And that is a little practice which I love to do, the five senses check-in, five senses meditation. You can do this as long or as short as you want. I find this very, very centering. I find this coming back to my five senses. Mm, so. I was doing it with you and, uh, yeah, feel a bit more present in a different way. Yeah, I was obviously very present with you, uh, but that changed it slightly, maybe a bit more from concentration to open awareness exactly. so thank you very much Daniela I'm so uh, looking forward to 
working together again soon. And, uh, and yeah, fascinating to hear a bit more about your life. I knew bits of most of it, but not so much the detail. So thank you very, very much. And um, uh, if you want to find out more about Daniela, her website is Daniela with one L, Veltzel, W-E-L-Z-E-L dot com. And uh, it will be in the show notes as well as a link so you can find out more about her. And if you're in, if you're a strong woman in need of help, admit it and uh, give her a, give her a call or a message. So, uh, so I usually do orientation calls. So we will have like a short chat, like an intake to see if we are a good match uh, before we're starting actually to work together and um, I'm charging you. So yeah, <laughs> if you I think that could be something for you, contact me, make an appointment and we have a quick chat and see if it's actually something where I can help you with. Brilliant. Highly recommended. So thank you all for tuning in and uh, we'll be back soon. Thank you. Well, actually, if you like that, you'll probably like embodimentunlimited.com and our app. Um, so on both of these things, you can get a bunch of podcasts that aren't available here and some exclusive ones with some big names and people you'll probably recognize that are over there. Um, there's um, a copy of my book, PDF, my first book on embodiment, which uh, seems to have people like. I sold quite a few copies on Amazon, but there's a free copy there. Um, what else is there? Loads of videos of me coaching embodiment, resources on trauma, on meditation, on yoga. And you can also chat to people without going on Facebook or any of that nonsense. Um, so if you want to chat embodiment with people, that's there. And it's on the embodimentunlimited.com, all free, and the app available at the App Store and all that good stuff. So if you like this, do check those out.